Hello everyone. Uh, today we're lucky enough to be joined by Dr. Anthony Shafee, uh, who is a surgeon and also a nutritional researcher. He's 100% carnivore and has a different take on nutrition than what you'll find in the mainstream. Dr. Shafee is also an ex-professional athlete, having played for America in rugby union, um, and you've also done a bit of MMA, I believe. Yeah, yeah, prior to that, since I was about 14. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right, so the topic for today is sugar. Um, and I want to start off by asking, um, what don't we know about sugar, Dr. Shafee? What, what, do what don't we understand? Uh, well, we first have to sort of distinguish between like, what kind of sugars are we talking about. Okay. So when we say sugar, generally we mean table sugar, but obviously there are a lot of different carbohydrates that are called you know, simple sugars. The sugar that you want to watch out for is fructose specifically. So that is, you know, obviously it comes in fruits and so forth, but it's you know, half of sucrose. Sucrose is a disaccharide of glucose and fructose. And then you have high fructose corn syrup, and that's been painted as this sort of evil monster, and it is, but it's almost like identical to sucrose. Uh, because it has very similar levels, almost 50-50% fructose, glucose. But it's just a mixture of the two as opposed to being a, a bound form. And then honey actually has more fructose than both of those. Yeah. yeah. So the, the problem with fructose is that is how it's metabolized in your body. It's actually non-essential. It's not something that you need in your body. There are no biochemical processes in your body that require fructose that can't be done by something else. So you don't need it at all. A major problem is that it goes directly to your liver and then gets broken down from there into fatty droplets and other, other sorts of uh, byproducts. The problem there is, is that it actually gets broken down to the same byproducts as ethanol, alcohol, right? So you get the same diseases and damage to your body from eating fructose as you do from, eat, mm -hmm. from drinking alcohol. So you can get fatty liver disease from yeah. being an alcoholic and from eating too yeah. much sugar. Exactly, yeah. So they, they actually, it actually used to be you know, very well known that only alcoholics got fatty liver disease. And then in the 1990s, when we started eating, increasing a lot of our sugar consumption, putting sugar in everything because we got rid of the fat and different foods and everything tasted horrible. And so they put sugar in everything. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, you know, 10 year olds were getting fatty liver disease and they were also getting adult onset diabetes. Type two diabetes used to be called adult onset diabetes because really only found it in adults yeah. and generally they were alcoholics. And that's because the alcohol really mm -hmm. causes that. And then all of a sudden 10 year olds are getting this and they're saying, well, wow, what, what's going on here? How can a 10 year old get adult onset diabetes? They're not an adult and you know, he's getting fatty liver disease, but only alcoholics get fatty liver disease. How can a, someone who's never drank alcohol get this? So instead of actually looking into this and actually thinking for literally one second, they just have said, you know what, we'll just, we'll just rename it. And so now it's non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Right, but it's and the same thing. Diabetes. It's exactly the same thing. Yeah, wow. Well, yeah. you, you mentioned something earlier um, about people adding, or companies adding sugar to food yeah. because they removed the fat, meaning it tasted yeah. terrible. Yeah, yeah. Fat, you, know, you talk to any chef, they'll tell you fat is flavor. Yeah, butter. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, and we were told that fat's bad for you. Mm. It's not. It's actually really, really good for you. Animal fat is. Yeah. Vegetable oils and so forth are actually quite toxic yeah. for a number of reasons. Um, but when you take that out, I mean, it takes very, very bland and horrible. Like even steak, like I love steak, but like a lean steak, you can only have so much of it before oh, it's just sort of like, eh, yeah, yeah. you know. Uh, whereas like a you know, fatty steak is obviously you interesting. Just keep going. Yeah, yeah totally. exactly. Um, so you mentioned before, fructose is one of the worst forms of sugar. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if I'm eating fruit, uh, I feel like there's a limit to how much whole fruit I can eat. Like yeah. I'm not going to eat more than two apples. Yeah. So. You, is it, is it dangerous or is it detrimental for people to be eating whole fruit? So obviously, you know, it's better, you know, because it's dose dependent, you know, but that's like saying, you know, I'm only doing two lines of Coke instead of a whole bag, yeah. you know? So, but yeah, you're right. It, uh, you know, two apples is very different than two glasses of, of apple juice. Yes, exactly. You know, like a glass of apple juice, uh, you know, I'll have something like 10 apples, you know, worth of juice go into that. It's gonna be a lot more sugar. Um, it's also been shown that the fiber in, in fruit and so forth, when you eat that, you know, delays the absorption of fruit. It delays the absorption of everything because you can't, it's, it's literally sawdust. That's what, that's what cellulose is, that's what fiber is. And they add sawdust into processed foods to up the, the fiber content. You know, there's tons of foods that, that can eat that. Um, and so what does that do? It, it blocks, you know, the enzymes and so forth from getting at these uh, the different foods in your in your gut, and it blocks them from actually hitting the you know the um, you know the, the the villi and things like that in your small intestine and getting absorbed. So it delays that, stops that absorption, then it gets into your colon and you know bacteria eat it and so forth, and you eliminate it. So it does reduce some of the the fructose in there, but 
at the same time, you are getting that stuff in, so you, it is very important to be aware of that. And you're also getting other things that you don't want as well. Fiber in and of itself actually causes damage to your gut lining, causes right. microabrasion, causes increased mucus secretion, inflammatory reaction, and so forth. And so people, especially with autoimmune disorders, Crohn's, also sort of colitis, they have a real hard time with fiber and so forth. Absolutely. So where do you think the story of fiber being good for us has come from? How do you think oh, it's yeah. kind of... Yeah, I, I, I mean, I remember this when I was yeah. a kid. So the, the entire argument on why we should eat fiber and, and vegetables in general is what... Everything was about fat fat craze in the 1980s. It was like, you know, fat busters and all these sorts of things. It was yeah, like, you know, diet, size, diet, diet, you know, fat, you know, you, you are what you eat. If you eat fat, you get fat. That was a whole argument. Yeah. completely wrong. Yeah. I ate a lot of fat. I got 70, 80% of my calories from fat. I generally maintain below 10% body fat, from, even when I'm not working out. And where do you get the fat from? From steak, generally, yeah, yeah. from beef and things like that. Butter, you know, like I melt butter into my ribeye steaks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in the 1980s, or 1980, 1978, 1977 to 1980, the USDA declared uh, unequivocally that cholesterol causes heart disease, saturated fat increases cholesterol, stop eating both of these things. Uh, that's completely wrong. It's going to be completely debunked. Um, but that changed how everyone viewed everything. So the obesity rate in England after World War II was 6%. In 1983, when they adopted these same, these same dietary models, it was still 6%. Now it's like over 24%. You know, same thing in America, it was 6% and 8%. Mm -hmm. And then it, you know, you know, tripled in, in a very short period of time. Um, so everyone started getting fat, everyone started getting sick, and they got even more crazed about not eating fat. Then they said, you should eat vegetables because they don't have nutrition, because they don't have calories, and because they have, they're bulky that and they have fiber, fiber, which you cannot absorb. So it was never thought, it was never actually argued at that time that this is nutritionally beneficial they said, hey, this isn't nutritionally beneficial, so therefore you'll feel full, so you can eat as much of it as you want, and you'll get full, and you won't, you won't get any fat. There was a celery diet where it said you can just, you know, it takes more calories to process the celery that you eat than you get from the celery. So like, oh, just eat all the celery you want. It's like, well, that's how much celery I want. You know? And they don't talk about all the you know, other things in there as well, which are very harmful toxic components that are in plants and vegetables and so forth that are that plant's way of defending itself against being eaten yeah. that people just aren't thinking about. But that was the entire argument, was that you can't break it down, you can't get nutrition from it. But it makes you feel full. But it makes it feel full, and you get the stress receptors, and your body, your body produces a bit of leptin, your brain goes, oh, I'm full, and so forth. Um, and it's nonsense. People are getting fatter, they're getting sicker, they're getting unwell. This is when uh, a lot of the eating disorders really took off you know, bulimia, anorexia, and so forth, people are starved for nutrients, mm -hmm. you need the fat, you need the meat, you need those things. But fat makes you fat, meat has a lot of fat, oh my goodness, stay away from it. And, they, and they're craving it, and everything in their body's like, you need to eat this, and so they'll binge and purge. Okay. They'll, they'll eat it, and then they'll go, oh my god, I can't believe I did that, and they'll vomit it up. Or, you get anorexics, which what, and people do have these sort of problems, a number of different issues, this is just one of them that's theorized, is that they, aren't going to eat the, the, everything that their body's craving them to have because that's going to make them fat. Mm -hmm. And they have a very strong aversion to all the vegetables and things like that because they don't make them feel good because of different poisons and so forth. They just don't feel good. They don't like it. They don't taste good. And so they just they don't eat at all. Yeah. yeah. And you get into a very pathological relationship with your food as opposed to being you eat food to you know, give your body nutrition. Now you're eating for a lot of other different reasons. Yeah, absolutely. So if we, if we go back to the effect that sugar mm -hmm. has on your body, so we talked about fatty liver disease. Mm -hmm. um, how else is, is sugar affecting our bodies? Yeah, so um, Professor Robert Lustig, who's a you know, professor emeritus uh, at University of California, San Francisco Medical School mm -hmm. um, in pediatric neuroendocrinology. So he deals with kids with you know, bad you know, diabetes and things like that. Um, he, along with the biochemistry program at UC, UCSF, which is, it's a, I think last time I checked, it was like the number six medical research institution in America, so it's a very, very top institution. Yeah. They show biochemically, you know, how fructose is, is broken down in your body by your liver and so forth. Um, and, and it shows like all these different sorts of things. And it, it also showed that it causes uh, peripheral insulin resistance, which is type 2 diabetes. Uh, it's also in, in, you know, involved in atherosclerosis and so forth, so you know, heart disease. We've actually had studies showing, or suggesting anyway, that sugar caused heart disease back in the 40s and 50s. And it was actually then that the sugar companies got wind of this and they said, like, okay, we need to cover this up. 
and that's bad. I'm not sure that's it. And so they they actually the, the Journal of American Medical Association actually published this in 2015. Actual internal memos from the sugar companies back then, uh, detailing how they paid off three Harvard professors to falsify data and publish fraudulent studies to make it appear as if cholesterol is causing heart disease when it was really sugar. And then one of those professors was named head of the USDA in 1965. And then all of a sudden the USDA just declares that this is happening, and you know it's appealing to authority. You know. You know, teacher says so. You know, says that cholesterol is bad, therefore cholesterol is bad, and it, it, it completely, uh, well, you know, ruined the reputations of everyone. They're saying no, 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 it's really sugar, and it really actually destroyed their careers and their livelihoods and so forth. And and they were, then they were dead right the whole time. So uh, Lustig showed that showed that this does the same damage to your body as alcohol after it's after it's broken down. Obviously, it doesn't make you drunk and have the same central nervous uh, effects, but after it's broken down, it has the same damage to your body and kids as well, you know, and give them, you know, people don't realize how much sugar is around. Mm -hmm. You know, you never give a kid, you know, whiskey, I hope, you know, and, um, but, you know, you probably give them, you know, orange juice. Yeah, other absolutely. juices, right? Yeah. Well, one 12 ounce glass of orange juice has as many grams of fructose as three shots of 40% whiskey have alcohol and does the same damage to their little body. Um, so he, he was showing all, all sorts of things and, he, and he's written, you know, dozens of papers on the subject, uh, he's written books on the subject and so forth, done tons and tons of talks as well that are, are available, readily available on YouTube. They're very interesting. He just talks about fructose and how damaging this is and how it causes sort of the same things as alcohol, fatty liver disease, cirrhosis, diabetes, even heart disease. Uh, it's implicated in cancer, it certainly feeds cancer, if not you know, precipitating and causing cancer, um, and, is, and even has a strong correlation with Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is now referred to in some circles as type three diabetes. And so, oh, there's these similar metabolic changes and effects that we're seeing in this disease process as, as with type two diabetes. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, yeah, no kidding. It's, they have the same cause, or at least they have one of the same causes. That, that's they interesting. I, I remember reading reports mm -hmm. about uh, elderly people who have Alzheimer's being put onto a ketogenic high fat diet yeah. uh, and the Alzheimer's being prepared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it was, it, um, there, was, there was quite large studies with that, but yeah, high-fat ketogenic diet they found was, best, it was a better treatment model than every Alzheimer's drug that's ever been trialed. Right, okay. You know? Um, Less profitable, probably. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, I mean, that's the thing with, with doctors now is, is you know, we're all, we're, usually for, for thousands of years of medicine, you know, you had a disease that came up and, or an injury or something, and you had a treatment for that thing. Yeah. Um, and so now we're looking at this, now we have these chronic diseases, ah, this is a disease, we need to treat this disease. But the problem is it's not a disease. These are toxicities. These are, these are poisoning coming in, you know, sometimes we recognize something as poisoning, you know, lead poisoning is, it was like the Romans, right? Back in the day they had, they had lead pipes mm -hmm. and they all had sort of low grade lead poisoning for, you know, however long. And they just thought, well, this is just how you age, this is how you do, and this is normal. And it's like, well, no, actually, it's not normal. Something's happening, something's making us sick. They figured out it was lead pipes. So we're living in that now. We don't realize we're being poisoned, but we're all being poisoned. So like vegetables, fruit, you know, bread, sugar, these sorts of things, they're, they're all our lead pipes. And you, know, you have to have some outsider looking in going like, I can tell you that this is not normal. Mm, that's a very interesting perspective. I saw something on your Instagram that I reposted yesterday mm -hmm. where you were talking about I think it was Native Americans living yeah. to you know, 120 years plus, 120 yeah. years. Yeah. Uh, whereas now it's rare to find someone in good health over 80. Uh, and and yeah. even over seventy, it's rare. Yeah, well, and think about think about you know the native Australian population. Um, they're generally quite poor health in, in medicine here. We just say whatever that whatever their age is, just add twenty to it because that's metabolically okay compared to the general population. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So if you saw that someone comes in at thirty five, you consider them like a, you would a fifty five year old, and then those sorts of you know co you know considerations and, and so forth at that time, they're they're more at risk. Um, the that's from eating the wrong thing. We know as geneticists for decades now, at least, I think at least 20 years, mm -hmm. that chromosomally, genetically, the human animal should live 120 years. Wow. Right? And, and that's just if you just don't do anything special, like if you just don't get in your own way. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not harming yourself, you're not smoking, you're not drinking, you're not eating bad food. You should live to 120 years and we're all dying in our 60s and 70s. Um, native populations are dying quicker than that. Um, but they didn't used to. And there was actually a study here in Australia that noticed that and said, well, you know, this isn't what, you guys don't, don't normally eat a, you know, a Western diet. You normally eat 
animals you find in the bush. Well, let's get you back on that diet and see what happens. It just reversed all their diseases, reversed their obesity, and gave them very, very big health benefits. You know, in America, there have been you know, books written about it, like all sorts of things back, you know, hundreds of years, um, you know, showing how these people were just pure carnivores and they had, they lived great, great age and people would be, could be dismissive of that and say, well, they're probably just saying that. They're probably just, you know, saying okay. that because they put great weight in, in longevity yeah, and so forth. Or whatever, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, oh, well, he just says that. Well, I mean, that's your assumption. Yeah. But there's all these different native populations that all basically say, oh, I was born the year that volcano erupted. And they're like, that was like 120 years yeah, ago. Yeah. Like, that can't be. And they just assume that they're lying. Oh, but, it's like, but, it's, but every single time, every single case, and every single country, and every single continent, they're completely mm -hmm. different from I'm each other. Well, yeah, well, well, I mean, who cares? Yeah, I mean, and you know, maybe one culture, you know, puts great stock in that and be like, oh, yeah, well, that's, you know, Lazarus, and he, he lived a thousand years, and I'm like, okay, all right. The wasps is bad. Yeah, exactly, but, you know, every single time, in every single culture, on every single continent, I don't think that would really hold water. And we do know now that genetically we are supposed to live that long if we live naturally. Mm. They're living naturally. Um, uh, Dr. J. H. Salisbury, uh, the eponymous for the Salisbury steak, um, he actually was a New York doctor in the 1800s who did a 30-year research project into the optimal nutrition for humans. Okay. He you know, went with the Native Americans, saw they were only eating meat, only eating buffalo, and they were living these great ages, and there's actually quite a lot of documentation to, to support that and show that. And he was saying, he was showing, they were, they were so healthy, they were just running around, doing these things, they were 110, 115, and he was like, that's crazy. Dr. Salisbury, did you say? Yeah, Salisbury, J.H. Okay. Salisbury. Uh, yeah, he wrote a book research. about all this stuff in, in the 1800s. On oh, the yeah, wow. Awesome. Yeah, 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 so we've known about this for a long time. He was, you know, he was finding people that, this is long before sugar, you know, really became a problem. And so it was just people eating plants and bread and all these sorts of things. And he found that people that were eating you know, plants and bread and so, you know, Western diet. Yeah, uh, they were getting diseases other people simply weren't. Mm -hmm. You know, they were getting sicker easier. They're more susceptible to tuberculosis. They uh, were getting rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, gout, uh, all these sorts of things. And he found they put them on a pure red meat and water diet. They would, they would just go away. So he was curing rheumatoid arthritis in the 18, 100 years before any medications. Just goes away. Happens today. There's quite a large population of people with autoimmune disorders, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, rheumatoid arthritis, and, and so forth. They're just completely getting rid of their immune, immune uh, autoimmune dis diseases. The very famous one would be um, Michaela Peterson, Jordan Peterson's mm -hmm. daughter. Yeah. She had horrible rheumatoid arthritis where she actually Total had... Total joint replacement. Yeah, right? two of them. Two of them when she was a teenager. And it's gone now. Yeah. She's off all her horrible medications. She's having kids now. I mean, she's, you know, she's doing great. And that's really good to see. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, as, as far as like, you know, the Native Americans are concerned, I remember hearing when I was a kid that when on a Western diet, Native Americans were four times as likely to get obesity, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking at the time, well, doesn't that mean that the food is causing the disease? Yeah. You know, because if they don't eat the food, they don't get the disease. And we eat the food and we get the disease just at a lower rate. You know, and then it was just like, okay, well, what, what's a Western diet compared to a non-Western diet? What's their diet? What are they eating that we're not and vice versa? Well, they didn't say it at the time, but it was a pure carnivore diet, generally, generally red meat. Then buffalo, you know, the Inuits and so forth would be mm -hmm. eating seal and polar bear and whale and things like that, but exclusively meat. You know, there's so many explorer studies or um, journals and books and things like that that are written in Australia and America that I've read, and they always have a chapter or something that they talk about, like the diet of the native people, and they marvel how they only eat meat, how they're crazy healthy. Up north, I remember reading one, um, where this guy was just, shocked that you know these people wouldn't wouldn't eat any plants at all ever or any bread ever and they didn't want it it was just like they'd offer them but oh, no no thank you um and they were talking about you know the inuit specifically you know some of them you know in the north pole there's just no plants ever you know yeah, obviously. Right. Yeah. but some of them no yeah exactly yeah so you know one's more southerly um you know, they're saying, like, okay, well, I understand, you know, nine months out of the year, everything's just packed with snow. Mm -hmm. But for three months out of the year, you know, when the snow melts, and this is in his words, surely they could live off the bounty of the land. And, but they don't. They don't want to. Mm -hmm. And, and they, they really wondered at that. Well, that's why. You know, stuff's bad for you. It's not very good. You know, you could, you know, different native populations would know what to eat uh, in times of, of starvation. But if they didn't need to, they didn't eat it. You know? mm -hmm. And so, and that was the thing, you know, we used to call these things the diseases of the West because only like the Western peoples eating a Western diet would get them. We experience them, yeah. Yeah, and so then you go to these places like, oh, they don't get the disease of the West. Now we just call them getting older. 
and that's normal. And people don't realize how abnormal that is. You know, the, the heart disease rate since 1980 tripled. The obesity rate has tripled. The stroke rate has tripled. The cancer rate has tripled. Type 2 diabetes has gone up by 5.8 times. You know? there's, there's this sort of sense of, like, you, you compare yourself to the previous generation. Mm -hmm. so, so we, or I find that you tend to, we tend to compare ourselves to, say, our parents. I mean, you look at our parents, it's like, oh, well, I reckon I can live five years, you know, longer than, mm -hmm. than my dad. Um, yeah. And, uh, but now we have this modern, modern medicine and the actual quality of the life might not be as high. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really hard to have this perspective that you've got mm -hmm. where you're looking at 1800s, 1700s, mm -hmm. native populations who've been yeah. you know, living a certain way for thousands of years. It's, it's so easy to just look at here and now yeah. and not actually zoom out. Um, like, you know, like the work of Western A. Price is similar. Yeah, yeah, where yeah. He's a you know, dentist in the 1930s traveling yeah. around the world looking at these native populations yeah. who have incredible health, but their children who are getting exposed to the Western way of life, yeah. you know, they've got crowded teeth yeah. and, you know, um, and just terrible health. Yeah, well, they found, uh, there was a, I was reading a uh, journal in dentistry, and they were talking about how crooked teeth and small jaw size is not genetic, that it's, it's uh, nutritional. And it's generally a nutritional deficiency. You know, you, have, you need K2, K1, calcium, and uh, vitamin D for proper jaw and teeth formation and straight teeth and so forth. Um, and these things don't really exist too readily in plants. Certainly K2 doesn't. And so that's generally what we see is, you know, someone has like, a, you know, we may be deficient in everything, but generally almost you know, a lot of people are deficient in K2. Mm -hmm. And so they have these, you know, crooked, crowded teeth. They, you know, they're not, their wisdom teeth aren't coming in. Like, that, that's a very new thing. Mm -hmm. Actually, people are like, oh, we're, we're evolving. Like, not in two generations, dude. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, I've wondered about that. It's like, yeah. how can we all need to go to the dentist to get mm -hmm. them taken out when, uh, yeah. you know, what would, what would our ancestors have done? Not that. Yeah. Yeah, Just well, they don't need it. Yeah, I mean, you look at, you look at cavemen skulls and so forth, you know, you know. Um, you know, before they, I was just actually talking to someone about this the other day. Apparently, uh, paleontologists can tell if a skull is before or after the agricultural revolution just by looking at their teeth wow. and jaw size, you know, and, and the quality of their teeth if they're having cavities and so forth because they just didn't happen before that. Think of animals in the wild. They, they don't have rotting teeth, they're just hanging out of their mouth. Well, what, they don't brush their teeth? They don't go to the dentist? How can that be? Well, they're eating their natural, their natural diet mm -hmm. and their, their body is able to accommodate that. Um, you know, you don't see animals in the wild with crooked teeth, you know, strange, creepy jaws. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, you see a lot of people teeth. do that. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Well, you give them the zoo, sometimes they'll give them fruit. I don't rot their teeth. Mm -hmm. You know, they mean, the only, you know, uh, gorilla that eats bananas are on cartoons and the zoo. You know, in the wild, they, they generally don't do that. That's not their, that's not their staple diet. Mm -hmm. and, and their teeth work better for that. Yeah, sure. All right, so we'll circle back to sugar. Mm -hmm. Avoid fructose. So yeah. I'm guessing fruit juice, avoid like the plague. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Honey. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, what other foods are people consuming that are plant and sugar mm -hmm. that you know might be really damaging their health but they don't realize it? Is there anything else you put on that, on that list? Um, you mean apart from sugar? Well, or I suppose anything that has sugar anything in that's it. high in fructose. Well, Any, obviously yeah. soft drink, you know soft drink. Yeah. Anything, anything that you didn't make probably has yeah. sugar in it because they add it to everything. The sugar companies know full well that this stuff is addictive, and it is addictive. It gives a dopamine response to the addiction centers in your brain, just like cocaine, heroin, and meth. And there were MRI studies showing that fructose kills the same areas of your brain as meth mm -hmm. to the same extent as meth. Okay, so um, that's, that's quite appalling. It's, an, it's, an, it's a very addictive drug. I think it's the worst drug on earth, specifically because you know, we don't realize that it's a drug at all. It's so everywhere. it's in everything. Yeah. And we get kids addicted to it, go, oh, but they like it. You know, they probably like you know, cigarettes and Coke too, mm -hmm. you know, once they got addicted to it. It's, it's very, very harmful. It, you know, it's addictive like meth, kills you know, the, the reward centers in your brain like meth, and damages your body like alcohol. How is this not you know, an age-restricted Mm -hmm. Chemical. Yeah. Um, there was a, I forget uh, the guy's name, but he was a you know a very well known doctor in Amsterdam, and you know he's been saying for quite some time as well that sugar is the worst drug on earth. I absolutely agree with him. And this guy's from Amsterdam, like they know about drugs there. You know, 
So. All right. Well, I think we'll leave it there. Cool. Dr. Shafi, that was brilliant. Yeah. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thoughts on sugar. Thanks very much. You're welcome.